We're here for the Strong Australia in Bendigo and I'm delighted to be joined by Jennifer Westacott, the Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia and Marnie Baker, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. Great to be here with you both as we explore the opportunities for Bendigo and surrounding regions. Jennifer Westacott, first to you. This is the BCA's series looking at how we recover out of, the, out of the pandemic, what are the prospects like for a place like Bendigo? Yeah, well, I think it goes beyond recovery. This is to me is like how we thrive, how we now kind of prosper as a country. And I, I, I come to Bendigo and we've been talking to the community for years for the first time we've been able to get here physically for a while. You know, you've got this incredible agribusiness uh, opportunity here. You've got an airport. Uh, that could actually kind of go straight to uh, Asian economies. You've got this incredible manufacturing base here. We went to a, a family manufacturer today making those really specialised parts for the big uh, defence giant Thales. You've got uh, a lot of uh, local manufacturing. You've got you know, very high end food production. You've got a health precinct. Uh, you've got great educational facilities, you've got terrific TAFE, you've got obviously Bendigo Bank, you know, one of the biggest banks in the country here in Bendigo employing heaps of people. You've got a new gold rush employing nearly a thousand people. So you look at this and you say, this is the kind of frontier for Australia. If we could really get this organised and get this coordinated, this, this, you know, this would actually not just allow this region to thrive, it would allow the country to thrive. And we, this is, um, well, let's touch on your business, the, the only major bank headquartered in the regions. You've got, a, you've got branches in every state and territory and uh, customers right across the country, all out of this city of Bendigo. Can you explain that story, but also how you connect to the, the business community here? Yeah, so we're an organisation 163 years old, so we did actually were born out of the, the gold era and the gold rush times. Um, but we are a really good example of you know, an, a business that, that can thrive uh, in the regions uh, and like I said have been doing that for over 160, 160 years now um, to become what was a very localised organisation to now a national organisation represented in every state and territory. Um, and I think the key to that is really the grassroots nature of regional Australia. It's actually living and working and knowing, you know, the community that you're operating in. And, and we've always spoken about in our organisation that unless you actually have, you know, successful customers and a successful community, you can't be a successful business and you're not going to thrive unless your community is thriving. So it's that connection and that local connection that you have that I think is the secret to businesses like ours that have really thrived in regional Australia. Bendigo seems like it's got so much going forward, whether it be the, the culinary scene, to the, uh, the arts, to the agriculture, to the high-end manufacturing, engineering you're talking about. But it seems that it needs just a little of, of governments to assist to get some of the roadblocks out of the way. Is that yeah, fair to say? Yeah, I think that's right. I think so. If, like, I think you know, there's just got to be a bit of long-term planning and a bit of government kind of partnership. So, you need something that allows all that manufacturing to come together. So, you know, you see things around the world, places like Sheffield in the UK, where they put a facility there uh, that allows small enterprises to prototype things, to gear them up, it introduces them to larger companies, you start to create that big ecosystem of um, advanced manufacturing. Then you've got like the potential to get those high-end agriculture products out, not, not through Melbourne, but straight out into those big uh, Asian markets. And so you have straight from Bendigo straight Airport. Straight to Bendigo Airport. And then you need maybe a kind of integrated logistics hub to kind of send things out. You need, I think, a kind of different skill system because you need to skill people faster. Maybe we need a migration system here where you kind of offer people faster tracks to permanent residency. So they're the sorts of things government can do. And then there's the sort of long-term planning around industrial land, land for housing, fast-tracking land release, giving incentives. You've got to get it all working together. And then the private sector says, actually, that is a place where I can get the skilled people I need, I've got reliable access to land, I've got connectivity, and then the equation about staying somewhere in Asia or coming to Bendigo or coming to uh, other parts of Australia, that starts to stack up. Well, we, we know that through the pandemic, don't we, Marnie, uh, and I'm sure it's the same in Bendigo, but a lot of people leaving the capitals to go to the regions yeah. for the lifestyle, 
during the pandemic. I think it was highlighted more than ever the need for space, and uh, it's very attractive. But it, you can't do it unless you've got houses to go and live in. And that's a, a real problem here, isn't it? We talk about sort of bottlenecks. That's a big one here. Yeah, and that's the pressure that we've seen not only here but across many sort of regional centres as well is that the people are coming and we have seen a net migration into, into regional Australia and especially to those um, regional cities that are within you know, an hour or two hours of, of the capital cities. But it does actually put some pressure on the infrastructure and housing is an example of that. And so you do need to have somewhere to live and somewhere like Bendigo here where we've seen quite an influx of, of people coming and living here and working here uh, in the, the local Bendigo uh, region uh, is that we just haven't been able to keep the, the housing supply up. and. You know, and some of the things that we've spoken about um, today while we've been together is that, that it just takes too long sometimes for the developments to get underway um, and the processes to go through, the planning processes. So um, they're the sort of things that we do need to really address uh, as we are seeing. And I think it is a more permanent um, move of people actually discovering just how good it is to be living and working uh, in regional Australia. Well, you, you get a lot of your life back, don't you? Because you there's, do. <laughs> there's less time with all the drama of traffic and all the, all the rest of it. But Jennifer, if you look at sort of where we are at the moment in terms of our economy and the global mm. economy, mm. it's a precarious time, it's an inflationary environment, interest rates on the rise. It's, it's uncertain, but what you're talking about, I guess, is the productivity driving reform. Absolutely. That, the, that outsee the turbulence. Absolutely, and that's a really good way of putting it. Like, there's no doubt that I think we expected a smoother landing from, from mm. COVID and it's much more bumpy than we expected. You know, clearly we've got the combination of inflation, our energy problems, our price problems, um, obviously, you know, global uncertainty, our big supply chain blockages. Some of that you can control for, some of that you can't. So what can you do? Well, you can start to lay the seeds to make your economy more productive. You can start to lay the seeds to be at the frontier of where growth is going to come from. Um, and you can start to sort of control as many of the controllables as you can and, and make sure, because these things, these cycles do end. Mm -hmm. And where you want to be at the end of those cycles is in a stronger position because you took the decisions in an emergency to position the country in a different way. And they're the sorts of decisions we need to take. And they do come to things like, you know, obviously we've got to fix our energy problems and we've got to fix our, you know, our kind of disincentive to invest. But if we really kind of focus as well on places and getting places going, I think we'll come out of these things much stronger country. And Marnie, did, in, Marnie Baker, in terms of what Jennifer's saying there about some of these changes, it seems to complement what Bendigo's already got in terms of uh, high-speed broadband, uh, mm -hmm. very good medical services. It seems like some of the pieces are already in place to attract the right people and businesses and skills, but it's just a few other pieces that need to go in to make it actually surge ahead as a city and a region. Yeah, I, I think we're just on the cusp of our next step, um, you know, as, as a region. We do have all of those foundational pieces like you were just referring to and, and Jennifer was talking about before. So it's a really attractive place to call home uh, here. Um, sometimes I think we're a bit humble um, as a city too uh, and perhaps we don't promote ourselves to the extent that we actually could. So there's a number of things. There's one, being really sure yep. about the things that we need to be doing here and, and getting through some of that red tape that we've spoken about, making sure that we have the infrastructure that actually is available to support um, you know, a, a healthy way of living here um, in a city like Bendigo, and then just promoting and promoting, you know, um, just all the virtues that we do have in this local area. Jennifer, uh, go, taking the sort of the helicopter view mm. now, uh, do, do you think we'll avoid a recession? Well, I think you'd rather be here than anywhere else mm. in the world. I mean, your starting point here is so different. I know people are kind of concerned and they should be concerned about some of the things that we're seeing. But uh, I think if you were going to avoid a recession anywhere in the world, you'd avoid one in Australia. You saw, you know, the jobs numbers this week. We're still creating new jobs. I think it was 50,000 this, this, uh, in the last bit of data. You've still got an unemployment rate at 3.9%. You've still got the economy growing really strong. You've still got the banks with incredibly strong balance sheets. Most households have got strong balance sheets. 
uh, you've got very resilient businesses. So I think if you were going to be anywhere in the world facing these crises, you'd be in this country. But we've now got to start to make really careful, thoughtful decisions, uh, whether they be about our energy situation, whether they be about driving productivity through skills, through re, um, reimagining an industrial relations system that drives innovation and productivity, uh, through reducing the red tape that Marnie's talking about. Now's the time you lay the groundwork so that you come out of this in a different way. But you'd, you'd rather be here, Kieran, than you would be well, anywhere. On the energy situation, yeah. how did... Well, first of all, I, I guess we, we have a sense of how we got here. There's been a, quite a bit of dysfunction in that space for more than a decade. This week you backed uh, the Labor government's sure. framework on its UN commitments yep. on emissions reduction is part of your and the BCA's motivation to give business a bit more clarity on that? Yeah, look, I, you know, I was proud to stand behind the Prime Minister yesterday and the uh, Energy Minister Chris Bowen and, and watch them sign that commitment to 43%. And I really urge the Parliament, I don't urge them, I'm pleading with them now, to just, let's get it done. Because, because what I think Australians want to see is progress. They want to see substantial progress. They don't want to see another year of arguing about the target. They want to see that we've got a direction. The government got a mandate for that target. Um, it's an ambitious target, but it's a doable target. And what business wants is an ambitious target that's doable, not an ambitious target that cannot be done. So we've got to get out of this terrible cycle that we've been in, where you've got one side saying, you've got to do everything all at once, which is just not doable and then someone saying, don't do anything. And what business wants to see is practical, sensible um, ambition, but also now we've just got to get on with it. We've got to design the safeguard mechanism. We've got to get the capacity market working so we drive reliability and affordability. We've got to get the system working effectively. And I think another six months of arguing about the target will just, it will take us back to Groundhog Day. And, and I think what business wants to see is, let's just get on with it. I think the community wants to see that. Do you that. think a domestic gas reservation is I think an if idea you're talking, that would fly? Yeah, the problem is that if you're talking prospective or retrospective, you start retrospectively reserving things, you've got a big problem. Because where do you stop with that in a whole lot of commodities? And also, what does that do to investment certainty? You know, what we need in this sector is investment. It needs nearly $60 billion worth of investment. So I'm not sure that's the solution, but prospectively. But, but you know, you, you can't reserve things you don't have. So if you kind of constrain supply, I mean, one thing we've got to get over, you need gas. Uh, for manufacturing, which we've been talking about here in Bendigo, you need gas. There is not an easy substitute for gas as a feedstock for manufacturing. So we've got to get rid of these moratoriums, these blockages, the red tape that's uh, really just hamper things like Narrabri, and, and try and make sure that we're building the new system while we replace the old system. That's what business wants. Marty Baker, we, we heard from Jennifer about the sort of the view on recession or no recession and we'd rather be here. Is that what your read is when you look at the strength of your customers and, yeah, and the broader economy? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's interesting, um, you know, hearing the conversation that's sort of playing out, especially in the media, you know, at the moment. As we sit here today and we look at all of the metrics, if you look at it from a financial perspective, so spending is continuing. Um, uh, the, the fact that on our balance sheets, and for example, on our balance sheet, that we've got 43% um, of our customers at least a year ahead in their housing repayments, a third of our customers two years ahead in their uh, repayments. So there's a buffer that sort of, sort of has been built there over the last couple of years that holds them in really good stead. So in the immediate, um, it's not looking too bad. I'm, I'm sure it's actually going to get a little bumpier, but we, we can't lose sight of just how good a position we're actually in if you think two years ago what we potentially were looking into and how we're sort of coming out of that now, we're in a much better position. And the bit that's different than what I think you can, if you look back retrospectively in other periods of time, is that we're getting close to full, full employment. And while people are, people have jobs, they will pay their debt. They will pay their house, you know, their house loan. They'll, they'll be able to actually invest in their businesses, etc., whilst you're employed. Marty Baker, Chief Executive and Managing Director at Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, thank you very much. And Jennifer Westacott, Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia, thank you both. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks very much. Thank you. 
This program has been brought to you by the Business Council of Australia. Authorised by R. Freelander, Business Council of Australia, Melbourne.